Uh, so it's a pleasure now to ask uh, Professor Stephen Holgate uh, from uh, the MRC uh, Council and Professor of Immunopharmacology and University of Southampton in England to give his lecture on the genetics of asthma. Well, thank you very much and thank you for staying this evening to uh, hear this last session. Leo, it's a real pleasure to come to Modena. I've never been here before. It's a wonderful place. You have beautiful trees, you have wonderful, wonderful fields full of vineyards, but there's no grapes growing on them at the moment, so maybe we'll sample those this evening. It really is a pleasure being here and to hear this terrific discussion today about issues that are fundamental, I believe, in trying to shape the way that we improve the management of asthma and other related lung diseases. But as was pointed out uh, in one of the earlier talks this morning, Human genetics, as yet, has not really provided us with very much useful in terms of clinical work, but promises a lot for the future. And I really do firmly believe that we have to invest in the future in asthma. I honestly believe that we are stuck in a rut um, dominated largely by the pharmaceutical industry in terms of how we manage this disease. And we've really pulled back from the principle of taking the high ground and trying to understand how we can cure asthma. And that's really what we've got to try and achieve, I think, in the long run. And it's no good just being satisfied with fixing the disease with a variety of drugs which suppress various forms of inflammation or just treat the symptoms. And I suppose genetics, if anything, is attempting to get behind the asthma process. And that's what I want to concentrate on today. I'm going to just talk about this single gene. I thought this would be better than trying to skip over a whole load of genetics, just to show you how interesting, I hope, and how complicated this might turn out to be. Now, anyone would think asthma is a new disease, the way we talk about it today. Um, of course it's not, and we all know it goes back many hundreds if not thousands of years, but it was Dr. Salter in 1860 who put a good definition around asthma, revealing its reversible airflow obstruction qualities. And since he had asthma himself, he was a very good person from a patient's perspective to describe what it was like. And in his book, published in 1860, we have that picture on the right, which very nicely describes what he thought was going on. And Marina knows I always show this slide because I think it's one of the most beautiful slides in asthma because this picture says everything to me about what we are and what we're not doing. We seem to know an awful lot about inflammation because all of our therapy is directed towards that. We know nothing about the muscle and the remodeling. We can relax the muscle, but we don't know why it's there and we don't know what relation that muscle has to the inflammation. Are they separate? Are they parallel? Are they dependent on each other? We don't know. So there's a lot to be learnt, I think, in trying to dissect the individual components of asthma. And this is where, of course, physiology does have its role. And airway hyper-responsiveness, I think, is a characteristic feature of this disease, which we're all very familiar with which enables us to grasp, maybe, some of the functionality of this abnormal airway and be able to look at it in relation to underlying mechanisms. Well, of course, we've heard some good examples during the pediatric talks today about susceptibility to asthma and the fact there may be susceptible genes that are involved in inflammation and others involved in airway wall structure. And we've also heard about important environmental in, in, influences, not only allergens, but a variety of other environmental factors. And we've had the debate about whether this interaction can actually generate a chronic asthma state with irreversible changes over time. Genetics, really, is a very straightforward subject because it's based purely on mathematics. The idea really is that every human being has a duplicate set of chromosomes 
And if you have genes that are abnormal on a particular chromosome um, and you then put markers across the human genome, you might be able to detect which part of the human genome with that marker moves either within a family or through families with a disease such as asthma. So this microsatellite genotyping, which has become very fashionable, now being replaced with single nucleotide polymorphism genotyping, tries to find areas of the genome that might move with the asthma, which is shown on this slide as black. And as you see, if you look at the individuals who have got the asthma, this blue marker seems to move with the asthma, and therefore it might be considered that there's an asthma gene somewhere in that region. And this is really the whole idea of positional cloning. And in 2002, with our colleagues in the United States, we described the first asthma gene to be positionally cloned. And the important thing about this was the fact that we were able to subphenotype asthma. And the key to all of this was the fact that the best linkage on chromosome 20 was to microsatellite markers that had a close um, relationship with the occurrence of bronchial hyperresponsiveness. And this is why this physiologic measure was a really useful way of disaggregating the complexity of asthma. Can I draw your attention to the fact that when we modified the phenotype with the allergic um, markers, such as IgE or specific IgE, the linkage signal weakened. So to cut a long story short, uh, the gene underlying this peak turned out to be ADAM33. There's been lots of studies since trying to replicate it in different studies. This is probably the best one. Uh, where they took all the published studies, plus some new data from, uh, from um, Iceland and from the UK, and did a meta-analysis and came up with a highly significant association. The F plus 1 single nucleotide polymorphism, which I'm going to come back to a little later, was the one that showed the strongest association with asthma. And if we just took those four significant polymorphisms there that were statistically significant across this large population, these alone could account for 50,000 excess cases of asthma in the UK. So I'm just trying to make the point here, while no one gene is going to account for asthma, if there are 15 or 20 important genes, then together they can account for a substantial portion of the increased risk of this disease. So this is ADAM33. It's a very complicated molecule. Remember, the beta receptor, which I think we're going to hear about in the moment, is made up of one exon. This little fella is made up of 22 exons, all spliced together. And each exon is labeled with a letter, A to V. And each exon, in its spliced form, encodes a region of the protein that has very specific functions. The catalytic domain, which has this zinc binding site in the protein, is typical of a metalloprotease. But you'll see there are other domains here. In particular, this domain here, a cysteine-rich domain, adjacent to an epidermal growth factor-like domain. And this is involved in cell-cell fusion, where membranes come together and fuse. Whereas this part of the molecule here, called a disintegrin domain, is involved in adhesion to integrin molecules. And they often call these atoms the beloved liberators, because what happens is that as the enzyme comes up on the cell surface, it locks onto an integrin, and that fixes it to its substrate, which is then able to act upon. And each of these functions, as I say, are probably important in the normal way this molecule operates. Now, the most important thing to remember about ADAM33 is the fact that it has a very restricted expression in tissues and in cells. It's almost entirely located in mesenchymal cells. Muscle, fibroblasts, myofibroblasts, skeletal muscle, cardiac muscle oligodendrocytes in the brain. 
but not in neurons, not in inflammatory cells, and not in immune cells. So we can go through a series of questions about what we know about this particular molecule. What's its function? Where is it expressed? What is known about what it's able to interact with? How many isoforms are expressed? And what happens if we knock it in or knock it out of cells or animals? Well, here is a slide from my colleague, uh, Dr. Hayachi, using an antibody against the intracellular sequence of ADAM33, which is present in all forms of the molecule, just to make the point that it is almost entirely located at protein level within the smooth muscle of the airways. And here you can see smooth muscle staining on the left and ADAM33 staining on the right. Possible roles, well, it's an enzyme, and these atoms can cleave um, growth factors and cytokines from their membrane precursors, and it's possible that this is what ADAM33 is doing. It's cleaving a protein, releasing a growth factor, which is driving a proliferative response, or it could drive not a proliferation, but a differentiation, turning a stem cell into a fibroblast or into a muscle cell. It might be involved in this fusion that I talked about, and we know that bronchial hyperresponsiveness is partly explained by muscle cells fusing together to form these, multi, uh, form these single muscle units, and as I mentioned before, it can interact with integrins such as this one here, alpha-1, beta-9, which is involved in fibroblast migration. We don't know for sure at the moment, but we've got some clues. How is ADAM33 regulated? Well, we know that in genes that it isn't just simple up and down regulation. There are little islands in human genes called CPG islands, which in bacteria are non-methylated. And we use CPG, you'll remember, as some form of vaccine adjuvant to create a Th1-like response. But in the human, these little CPG islands are methylated. And when they're methylated, it means that the gene becomes inactivated. And in ADAM33, there are three CPG islands. The one which is most interesting is this one here, which is in the promoter region of the ADAM33 molecule. And if we look at the methylation of the CPG, looking at fibroblasts from the lung and looking at epithelial cells from the lung, you can see that the ADAM33 in the epithelial cells in this CPG1 island is almost totally methylated, shown by those black blobs, whereas in the fibroblasts, it's unmethylated. And it's the unmethylation that switches on the gene. And here you can see it on the right-hand side, here we have the epithelial cells at the bottom, no ADAM33 expression, but when we remove the methylation, you can see the ADAM33 is switched on. So this is a very important epigenetic mechanism of controlling whether the gene is on or off. And environmental factors can alter the way these gene uh, uh, islands are methylated. You can do it the opposite way around. We can use something called 5-Aza deoxycytosine, which removes methylated groups from these CPG islands. And when we do that, as you can see here, now the dark has gone to light. In epithelial cells, which normally don't express ADAM33, we now can express the molecule, as you can see here. So by taking away the methylation, within the promoter region, you can switch on the gene. And so obviously the next question is, what regulates the methylation in this epigenetic control? And that's obviously something we're working on. Now at the end of last year, the crystal structure of ADAM33 proteolytic site was uh, secured around this particular inhibitor here called Marimostat, which is a classical MMP inhibitor. I just show this pretty picture because it shows you the calcium ion which is present here and the important 
very long loop here which restricts access of proteins into this active site, suggesting that Adam-33 has a very, very restricted substrate. So it's not like Adam-17 or TACE, which generates TNF-alpha, which has multiple substrates. This has got a very restricted substrate. And to try and discover the substrate, we had to start looking at how it could cleave different peptide sequences. Now, the normal way one does this is that you take a peptide of known sequence and you put a quencher dye and a reporter dye on it. And if the proteolytic enzyme cuts this and releases the um, reporter dye from the quencher dye, the reporter dye gives you a green fluorescence. And you say, yes, that's been cleaved. Well, with colleagues uh, in Southampton who've now moved to Edinburgh, we've developed another technique here where one can use gene arrays on plates to array peptides. And what one does is that you have a polynucleotide, single-strand polynucleotide, which encodes this particular sequence here. And this polynucleotide is then fixed, just as you would generate a, a gene array plate. And this time, if you um, fix that onto the plate, you can have, say, 10,000 different peptides all on one plate, all of different sequences. You can then come along with your Adam-33, which you don't know what it's going to cleave, and you just set it there and see what it does. And it'll cleave a few of these, but not all of them. The next thing you can do is to scan that plate with laser scanning mechanisms, and that can give you candidate sequences. That's led us to four candidate proteins that this Adam-33 cleaves. I can't tell you what they are at the moment because obviously they're very exciting. Two of them are involved in the generation of muscle. One of them is involved in the prolonging the life of fibroblasts. And the other one is involved in enhancing the migration of fibroblasts. So there are four genes there, four proteins there, which are obviously of great interest to us and will try and find out more. Okay, well there's the full length Adam-33 again, 22 exons. The problem is, is that fibroblasts in the lung and muscle cells in the lung express low levels of the full length molecule. They express instead these six alternatively spliced variants. And you'll see the bit that they've spliced out is the metalloprotease domain. Now this is important because it rather suggests that all of these different forms are either utilizing this end of the molecule, which is the fusogenic and the integrin type end of the molecule, or it's, they're serving as dominant negative molecules. So we've taken the full length Adam-33 gene and expressed it in COS7 cells, and here you see it, the protein at 120 or so kilo daltons. If now we have a look at the smooth muscle cells and bronchobiopsis from normal or asthmatic people, you can see that the level here of the full length is very, very low. In fact, it's almost undetectable. And almost all of the Adam-33 is in these alternatively spliced variants. I've blown up the slide there a little bit, and you can see here that clone one here, this protein here, is this variant. And the other ones are obviously higher molecular weight as we build up these different alternatively spliced sequences. So, this is complicated. Let's move on. The next question is if we have a look at asthma and we have a look at normal people, is there any difference in the expression either of the total molecule or of the alternatively spliced variants? And here you can see normal versus asthma, looking at messenger RNA for each of the splice variants, and there's no difference. Can I draw your attention once again to the very low level of the full-length sequence, which has the proteolytic uh, domain, some one, some one thousandth of the amount of some of these other variants, suggesting again that what's happening here is either these variants are operating on the inside of the cell doing something, or acting as dominant negatives controlling the expression of the proteolytic enzyme. When we look at the protein of Adam-33, not the 
not each of the different variants, but the total protein, again, we see no differences between normal and asthmatics. So our view at the moment is that ADAM33 is acting probably in one of its alternatively spliced variants within the intracellular compartment, but it could be limiting the amount of protein that reaches the cell surface to actually cleave proteolytic substrates. So to push this a little further, what we've now done is to attach the ADAM33, which is here, the gene, to green fluorescent protein and transfected those into COS7 cells. And here you can see the cells come up nice and green. And if we look at the endoplasmic reticulum marker in red, and we combine the two images, you can see the orange here means that most of the ADAM33 is in fact trapped within the cell, within the endoplasmic reticulum, and is not expressed on the outside of the cell. If now we transfect those cells with the disintegrin domain only, coupled to green fluorescent protein, you can see you get the same sort of sarcoplasmic distribution as we got with the full-length molecule. But if now you look at the disintegrin domain, sorry, the EGF domain, the EGF domain, which is the fusogenic part, you see a very different distribution now within the Golgi apparatus here and within small membrane vesicles. And these membrane vesicles are part of the fusogenic property of these atom proteins. Now this EGF-like domain here, this um, fluorescent construct, is very similar to the um, type 2 alternatively spliced sequence shown at the bottom there. Well, the next thing we wanted to do is to take the asthma-related single nucleotide polymorphisms and see whether they altered the ADAM33 trafficking inside the cells. And we had to, first of all, set up a system for doing this. So we took the CD4 receptor gene and added to it fluorescent green protein and then transfected that gene into the cells. And as you can see in two-dimensional um, confocal microscopy, you can see the CD4 protein being expressed here on the surface of the cells because CD4 is a membrane receptor. So that's the control. When we take TNF-alpha cleaving enzyme called ADAM17, which generates TNF-alpha, again you can see that there's transport onto the surface of the cell with these little spicules here bearing the active enzyme. <coughs> if we look at ADAM33, we don't, as I mentioned before, get transport to the cell surface, or if there is transport, it's at a very low level. We can hardly detect it. And as we go through these asthma-related genotypes, the S1 polymorphic variant, the T1, the T2, and the V1, there's really no difference from the uh, full-length molecule. Now, we still haven't completed all of this yet, but I suspect that we're still going to find that differences in transport aren't going to easily explain the association of ADAM33 with asthma. But still, we have to complete the work. <coughs> Now then, turning to phenotypes. This is a study that some of you will have seen, published last year, demonstrating that polymorphic variation in ADAM33 predicts a more rapid decline in baseline lung function in asthmatic people studied over a quarter of a century. And this is looking at the S2 genotype, and here you see the wild type, the heterozygote, and the asthma-associated genotype which increases the decline in lung function over time by about 25 mils a year. So that's really quite a big change. Then Jerky Postman and her colleagues reported at the ATS this year some interesting work in COPD, essentially showing the same thing, demonstrating that the asthma-associated genotypes like the F plus 1 and the S2 not only predict a more rapid decline in lung function over time in asthma, but also in COPD and indeed in the general population. So that's now obviously moving us away from just thinking about this as an asthma gene towards a gene involved in maybe repair processes or remodeling, which is what we talked about this morning. So let's move on 
one step further, since this is meant to be a combined conference about pediatrics, and think about how Adam 33 may be involved in lung development and in influencing the airway calibre of babies born of asthmatic parents. And we know that when the lung develops, starting at about four to six weeks, that this branching morphogenesis from the full gut leads to the lung gradually growing and dividing, and that this involves growth factors generated by these metalloproteases and the ADAM proteins. And if one knocks out these enzymes, then branching morphogenesis is interfered with. If we look at human embryonic lung at about six to eight weeks, we can see, as in the adult lung, that there are all these alternatively spliced variants. Interestingly, though, in the human fetus, <coughs> excuse me, we have this unique, very small variant here, for which we have no known function for it present, but we're very interested in it because I'll tell you where it's mostly located. That variant is mostly located not in the smooth muscle surrounding the developing airway here, but in these primitive stem cells or mesenchymal cells that are migrating in, forming the lung bud. And it seems to us very important, therefore, to understand why, thank you, in the fetal lung, the ADAM33 is playing a role, presumably, in, these, in the early um, mesenchymal cell transformation before it turns into muscle and what its function is at that level. And here you can see it by confocal microscopy. The blue here is the epithelium. The, uh, the green here is the smooth muscle. And here you see the fibroblasts, which are uh, in blue. And here you see in red the ADAM33 which is expressed in those mesenchymal cells right at the edge of the lung bud as the lung buds grow out uh, and mature. So it's obviously a very important molecule <coughs> in those particular uh, cells. Well, if I could now just pick up on Attilio's, Attilio's comments today about reduced lung function in early infancy being a risk factor for asthma and look at Adam 33. <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> this is a, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> a study we did with our friends in Manchester, Angela Simpson, Ashley Woodcock, and Adnan Kustovic, who you've heard about their Manchester allergy, asthma and allergy study from the earlier presentations. These were marvelous collaborators because they had all these children that were born of asthmatic and allergic parents, which they had phenotype data for, at the ages of three and five. And they helped us genotype the ADAM33 molecule with all these asthma-related polymorphic variants here. And I've just marked the full-length molecule here with the proteolytic component, which is round about here, and the pro-domain, which switches on this, which is round about here. And I want you to concentrate on this area here, which is an exciting area that we're beginning to focus in on. Because in terms of predicting impaired lung function in infants aged three years, we find that the F plus one um, and one or two of the other genotypes have a major impact in re increasing lung resistance. Here we have the wild type, the heterozygote, and the homozygote for the F plus one in these three-year-old children. And if we look at the children again at five, you can see the F plus one is still there, as are some of these other asthma-related genotypes. So this is exciting, because what this is telling us is that ADAM33, when genotyped in early infancy, is beginning to predict impaired lung function in infancy, which is transmitting itself over a period of five years, when asthma is beginning to emerge. And using a technique called linkage disequilibrium mapping, where one uses these different SNPs, what one can do is to look for areas which are not in linkage disequilibrium, where there are white, large white patches. And where there's a big area where adjacent to the uh, um, transverse here, you have uh, these large white patches where there's no linkage disequilibrium, which is this point here, and you've still got association with the disease, that suggests that there's a 
genetic abnormality here that's fundamental to why the association with asthma has occurred. And of course, I've drawn the little active site of the enzyme there because it's very close to that region. So that's the summary of the data from the Manchester study. So we were interested now to try and find out what bits of the ADAM33 molecule were really talking to the asthma phenotype. And the next step in the puzzle came from a collaboration that we've had with colleagues in the United States, Jean Bleeker, Deborah Myers, who are very interested in looking at gene-gene interactions. And their idea is that you have a polymorphic variation in this gene, but it doesn't act on its own. It acts in concert with other genes, and of course, as I said, through epigenetic mechanisms through the environment. And a paper published in Nature about four months ago um, from Yale University started to expose a very interesting aspect of complex human disease, and that's the ability of chromosomal regions talking to each other across chromosomes, and they called it kissing chromosomes. And that when a cell is stimulated, these chromosomes may part, and the gene-gene interaction here uh, diminishes. So we were interested to see whether we could detect any gene-gene interaction here with ADAM33. And the technique is interesting. What one does is one takes the nucleus from fibroblasts and one fixes it with formaldehyde. And what that does is that it cross-links the nuclear proteins, tying everything together. One then uses a restriction enzyme to cut the gene at known points and if the genes are in contact with each other, that will liberate a chunk of DNA from ADAM33 in red and DNA from another gene, which is in contact with, in green. The next thing you do is to use an enzyme that ligates the end of those two pieces of DNA. So it loops this round and seals it at that point, remembering that that's where the restriction site was where the uh, ECOR1 restriction enzyme cut the little piece out. The next thing that one can do then is to add a fluorescent label to that so that one can then use PCR to amplify this region here. And of course you know the sequence from ADAM33 but you don't know what this is. So we use some special gene walking primers that enable one to be able to uh, um, generate a new component of DNA here attached to the ADAM33 uh, which you're then going to sequence and that subsequently leads you to the bit of DNA which is obviously in contact from the original gene-gene interaction. So this is the first experiment where this was done. I've just marked on the left hand side where the F plus 1 SNP is. This is the area here which the restriction enzyme clips. Remember now that that'll be in the middle, that'll be in the middle of the, of the gene, okay? So there it is, in the middle there, that sequence. And on the left, we've got the bit of ADAM33, and on the right, the unknown gene. And the unknown gene happens to be, or the unknown chromosome, chromosome 7, which Bleeker and Myers had shown there was gene-gene interaction. And when we look at what that sequence is, close to the F plus 1, it seems that it's a gene encoding um, an important molecule involved in embryonic muscle development and the one next door is involved in um, a negative growth regulation of muscle, namely a maturation factor of the muscle. So these are really exciting observations because our proteolytic enzyme work, this work, are all pointing in a general direction towards the muscle etiology for this particular gene. So I'll end at this point uh, by highlighting, really, that this is a difficult journey we're on, but it's an incredibly exciting one because we've no idea where it's going to end up. One can use the most sophisticated methodologies to, uh, to arrive at the point uh, where one can start beginning to make predictions about where this gene may be working. We believe that it's important in early lung development. And using small interference RNA technology recently, knocking down a, um, ADAM33, we've shown that we can completely stop lung development in the fetus. 
in the developing fetal lung. So that's important. So subtle polymorphic variations in this gene may have quite important in, impacts on the way that lung develops. Secondly, we know that it's involved somehow in asthma, particularly in the hyperreactivity side of asthma and the decline in lung function over time. So the muscle, the fibroblast, the relationship between those two. And most recently from the work from Hernigan, the interesting observations that it may also be involved in COPD and the remodeling events there. So I'll come back to Attilio's comments because I think they're important. And I believe, as, a, as the reason I asked my question, that the maternal environment is important here uh, in terms of dictating the asthma phenotype, not only in terms of immunological development, but bringing now into the equation the structural side of the lung and the way the muscle and the airways develop. And that for real asthma to occur, we don't only need these genes that are involved here in the Im immune response, but we need genes that are involved in altering the way the lung develops in the fetus. And when these two things come together, then presumably we start to get some of the different asthma phenotypes that we witness. Finally, I'd like to thank a lot of people who have put a lot of work into this in the last three years, and in particular my friend and colleague Donna Davis. Thank you very much. <coughs> Thank you very much. Um, is there time for yeah. questions now? So, any questions for um, Professor Holgate? Um, this very clear and deep insight into this gene. Um, I don't see him, so I made profit for asking myself something. There are two points that came up to my mind. The first you mentioned that at the beginning of your talk about methylation and uh, the importance of it. So you've also shown experiments on demethylating, but obviously one might want to do methylation, and, and, and this might be a little more difficult to do, perhaps. Yeah. Oh, thank you. It's, thank you very much. Well, it, it's, if one picks up any science or nature magazine now, epigenetics is the way genes are regulated in complex diseases. And uh, this methylation process with these little islands are absolutely crucial. But there are also other areas of the genome which seem to be involved in related processes. Acetylation we know is important in terms of nuclear proteins and, as, and small microRNAs acting in the, um, in the <coughs> far end of the gene induction sequence. So I think as we're learning more from what other people are doing in genetics and molecular biology, we can start to bring these things in. But this is dramatic. I mean, methylation, demethylation. We know that certain cytokines can do this inside a cell. For example, TGF-beta, which is a very strong pro-fibrogenic cytokine, will strongly methylate ADAM33 and therefore prevent it from expressing itself adequately. So these are important molecular mechanisms, which we're learning about, of course. Yes. Okay. Steve. Very interesting review and um, focused on asthma and potentially also on other diseases. Now, because of the fundamental regulation of this gene, or what is believed to be that, are you also thinking about association with other? I mean, we talked about systemic in the previous presentation, so, I, you know, well, thank you, Leo. Um, though I didn't show it, um, we're just about to publish a paper showing a very strong association with coronary heart disease, and in particular, the increase in muscle that occurs adjacent to the atheromatous plaque in the coronary blood vessel. And again, ADAM33 is very strongly expressed there, and the genetic association is looking extremely exciting. So yes, I think what we're talking about here is a generic gene involved probably in the repair remodeling response that engages muscle wherever it is in the body, smooth muscle in particular. So coronary arteries are just one example. One of the, um, one of the proteolytic substrates that we found is involved in Duchenne muscular dystrophy. Uh, and again, we're, we're talking about, you know, 
other diseases here where there may be modifying genes which may influence the clinical phenotype. So this is what makes genetics so exciting, really. When God made us, he didn't make us one gene, you know, one disease, or one gene, one appearance. He, he makes us in a way that utilizes these molecules in a very imaginative way. And very, that's very, very intriguing, uh, Steve. While you were talking, I was thinking about two diseases that are, um, today we, we have an article on, on primary pulmonary hypertension and that has been worked out uh, at, at partially at genetics. Yes, the and the other at the pul yeah. for the pulmonary audience is lymphangial myomatosis yeah. that are co of course associated. Yeah. Is any insight or any studies ongoing in one of the... Yeah, yeah well they are. And, and uh, uh, in terms of primary pulmonary hypertension, we haven't done any work in that. And as you know, the Nottingham Group did a lot of work on BMP4 receptor polymorphisms in that particular hereditary form of pulmonary hypertension. Um, but in leomyomatosis, yes, we're getting some really interesting results with ADAM33. And we've found three different splice variants of ADAM33 present in those peculiar cells, because they're very abnormal, those cells, when you grow them up in tissue culture. So we've got a collaboration going with our friends in Nottingham who are helping us with this. I don't know what it means yet, but it's certainly interesting. If, if I may ask a second question, at the end of your talk, you were talking about gene-gene interactions, and you shown those very nice experiments in physical interacting genes. There are other ways to look at gene-gene interactions, and, and you probably have done some work on that already, because uh, from, like, for example, from the original work on microsatellite, on linkage analysis, you might have secondary peaks showing up, and you might try to see if those may be interacting or something. Yeah. Indeed so, and that's, and that's really where Deborah Myers and Jean Bleeker at, uh, um, in the United States are taking their genetic studies. And this is a very well recognized area now. The recent gene that they've reported just today, uh, as I read, uh, in schizophrenia, uh, operates very much in the way that you've just described, with at least three other genes interacting with it. Um, so yeah, I think this is, you know, it's a, the nucleus is not going to be a bunch of DNA acting all separately. You can imagine it's like a mini brain, really, where it's all connected up together. It's just that we don't understand it. <laughs> I think we have to move on. Thank you very much, Steve. I hope, uh, spero che la, questa presentazione vi abbia dato una, una un tocco di quanto stimolante possa essere la ricerca in campo genetico app applicata alla patologia, soprattutto quando eh, una ricerca molto focalizzata permette di esplorare un meccanismo che poi è estensibile a, ad altri modelli di malattia. Thank you very much, Steve. I think you, you provided a very exciting... Uh,